Okay, so um, I saw a comment from Saving Souls Ministries, um, a fellow YouTuber that I've had good fellowship with, and um, I thought the comment was from the heart and very thoughtful and also goes into a lot of detail and depth that to just write a YouTube response would be um, just very lengthy and wordy and a lot of the topics that need to be covered in order to properly respond are ver fairly nuanced and in order to communicate my response properly my response would have to be like t 10 pages long because it's it's covering so much in what was there that needs to be responded to properly so I just decided hey I'll just um, do a video response to it and then I can link the video response and I think I should do this more often it I think it's a cool method to use at least from time to time so let's go through it um, he writes I still have disdain in my heart for my witch mother who kicked me out at 17 after over a decade of child support funding from my pops and never really talked to me again unless I reach out. Right away I looked up disdain and it says disdain noun the feeling that someone or something is unworthy of one's consideration or respect contempt. Similar is scorn derision, condescension, disrespect, hauter, haughtiness, arrogance, indifference, distaste, dislike, disgust, opposite of admiration. So, right off the jump, I want to touch on the idea of having disdain in your heart for someone. The first thing I'd like to ask is, does God have disdain in his heart for people? And the obvious answer to that is yes, he does. Absolutely he does. Therefore, it's not necessarily a sin. The Bible says, Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day. It also says, Yea, in American Standard Version, Yea, a God that hath indignation every day. For the wicked, of course. So then the question becomes not so much should we be angry with the wicked, but rather does your anger have a root of love underlying it? One form of anger or hatred is murderous. The Bible says if you hate your brother, you're a murderer at heart. But then the Bible also says you must hate your brother, hate your father, hate even your own life. Or you're not worthy to be his disciple and to be his follower. So then there's a duality and a nuance to even hatred. You can have a carnal hatred where you just wish the worst for them. So then we clearly have two types of hatred. One is a perfect hatred for enemies of God, rooted in love, and expressed by speaking truth, a truth that the enemies of God hate to hear because it brings conviction. Another is a carnal and wicked hatred where you don't want reconciliation, you don't want healing, you don't want that person to come to a knowledge of the truth. You would rather that they remain in darkness. You would rather that they be separated from God. You would rather that they were tormented without ever coming to know the love of God. That is a hatred that's satanic. So if you hate the sin, love the sinner, that's a good hatred. You can also hate what the sinner represents 
you can hate their lifestyle and hate the words they're speaking if they're words that lead to death. You can hate the images conjured up by that sinner's practicing lifestyle. You can hate the dark forces of evil that that sinner is operating under the power of. But all the while, you must genuinely love, care for, and do good unto the sinner. And love hopes all things, endures all things. Love does not envy, love does not boast. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Although God keeps a record of our works, after we have confessed and forsaken our sins, He doesn't hold those sins over us. So, you can remember wrongs, and you can have wrongs held against someone, just as God does. I have this one thing against you, God says to one of the churches in the book of Revelation. We can have something against someone, but we don't have it against them if they've repented and asked for our forgiveness genuinely. If they've stopped doing it. If they're still doing it, they're still practicing this wickedness you held against them, then you should have and a righteous indignation toward what they're doing and toward what they're representing and who they're being. I think Christians get that misunderstood. They think that they should feel totally tolerant, accepting, and peaceful toward someone who is actively being evil, practicing evil. God says they are storing up wrath for the day of God's wrath. He has wrath that's being stored up so should we have the wrath of God stored up in us if he's abiding in us. We should feel some amount of wrath. But it's not our place to execute judgment against the sinners. That's God's place. He says, leave room for my wrath, for my judgment. Our job is to turn the other cheek. Our job is to be as a sheep to the slaughter. Our job is to be heaping burning coals upon our enemies by feeding them when they're hungry, by giving them water when they're thirsty. This is our way of attacking our enemies, pouring upon them more condemnation and more guilt by treating them so lovingly that they hate themselves for treating you wickedly while you treat them so wonderfully. So we should be treating them lovingly. However, sometimes treating someone lovely, love and lovingly involves telling them truths that they don't want to hear, gently correcting them, rebuking, reproving, and exhorting them and encouraging them toward good things and not bad. And that can look like hate to them because anything that doesn't support wickedness, which they love, is hateful in their sight which is a great deception. There's nothing more loving than telling someone the honest truth and warning them of the wrath to come. And God says, if I tell the evil man you shall surely die and you do not warn that man, their blood is on your hands. So we need to be warning and we can be firm and use your discretion as to how firm that is. But you want to try to do it in a way that is tactful and wise and measured and with self-control and you want to try to at all times have the fruits of the spirit on display even while rebuking although sometimes while rebuking you can show anger you can have righteous frustration but it should always have a measure of self-control and you should be slow to anger and uh, angry rebuke should be generally the, re the exception to the rule. And a gentle rebuke usually will do. And you're not supposed to angrily rebuke an elder.
but to petition them as you would your father in a respectful manner. So, if your mother or your father are extremely wicked, practicing witchcraft, serving demons, you can have a righteous anger about that, and a contempt, and a disdain. God has a disdain for people worshiping idols, and demons are idols. If people are being demonic, you should disdain that. You should not respect wickedness. One of the definitions of disdain was disrespect. The Bible literally says in Proverbs 18.5, To show respect to the wicked person is not good. Now that is the Amplified, which is generally a terrible <laughs> translation of the Bible. Here's American Standard. To respect the person of the wicked is not good, nor to turn aside the righteous in judgment. Okay, now this is another topic with nuance and some duality to it, because on the one hand, we're not to respect or to highly regard and think highly of those who are rebelling against God. That should be something and someone who we think low of, because they are stooping to a great low and spitting in God's face. How can you say, wow, I respect spitting in God's face. What a cool thing to do. No. But on the other hand, it says to respect your parents. So then, in that sense, we still owe them a certain amount of reverence, realizing they have some sense of ranking in God's sight over us as our authority, in a sense, particularly if we're living under their roof, for example. Um... And because they are our parents, just because we're called to respect them by God, we should always bear that in mind. Even when they're being wicked, we should refrain from being overly harsh toward them because that could be crossing the line, even if we are rebuking them, that could be crossing the line in God's sight if we're overly harsh. So we need to have some degree of fear of God when it comes to our interactions with our parents not to cross the line. If we don't honor our parents, we're going to have a shorter life, the Bible says. So it's actually a scary matter. The way we treat our parents in some cases is being seen by God as a reflection of how we'll treat God as our ultimate parent. And so we're to fear and respect our parents as we fear and respect God in a way or in a sense. But when our parents are being wicked, we're not to respect their wickedness or look highly upon them when they're in that state. But we still have to treat them with a degree of reverence higher than like our little brother or someone younger than us, for example. That would have less of a reverence. Even if our parents are being wicked, we still have to have a certain degree of reverence that's befitting um, in God's sight. We have to keep that in mind. So we need to walk that line properly and rightly divide the scripture on this topic. The Aramaic Bible in plain English translation says, To accept the persons of the evil is not good, neither to pray for judgment upon a righteous one. Um... The King James says, It is not good to accept the person of the wicked. NKJV, It is not good to show partiality to the wicked. So, we can be loving to people who are wicked, but we shouldn't respect wickedness. We shouldn't bow down to that. We shouldn't show partiality to it. We shouldn't show favor upon wickedness or people acting in wickedness. We can be loving to them. We can feed them when they're hungry. We can give them water when they're thirsty. We can hope for them. We can pray for them. We can admonish them. We can reprove them. We can correct them. We can speak truth to them. But we shouldn't delight in the wicked individual acting in wickedness. We should have 
a disdain for what they're representing. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. That's God himself speaking. He hated Esau. He hated what he represented. He hated the wickedness that would define the life he lived. He hated the wicked nations that would come forth from his seed. But that doesn't mean he didn't also love him on the other side of the coin. He also loved him tremendously. He allows the sun to rise and shine upon both the wicked and the just. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He longs for reconciliation to the wicked, and he will have it in his timing, whether in this life or the life to come. So, search yourself and see. I, I say, in your hatred for your mom, number one, we're supposed to hate as in love less. We love our mother, love our father less than God. So, we are supposed to hate in that sense, but we're also supposed to love them deeply at the same time. Well, hate them with a perfect hatred, but also love them deeply and long for reconciliation, long for restitution, long for healing, long for reconciliation, and express love to the person that's your enemy. Love your enemy. Express love, but also at times expressing anger to your enemies as well in the form of speaking truth and showing intolerance for sin. The Bible said, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Jezebel is someone that bows down to demons. We're not to tolerate people that are bowing down to demons, as in accept, approve of, and delight in that type of practice. We're not supposed to be accepting, approving of, and delighting in that. We're supposed to be calling out and exposing the unfruitful works of darkness. Calling out the sins. Bringing conviction and hopefully godly sorrow upon the sinner which may lead them to repentance. Godly sorrow leads a man to repentance. That's a wonderful thing if we can bring that into somebody. So there is a nuance to it. What I'm warning you about is that when the Bible says to forgive others, we forgive them when they confess and forsake their sin, just as God doesn't forgive until we've for confessed and forsaken our sins toward him. If somebody sins against you, you forgive them when they confess and forsake their sins. Now, if they have not confessed and forsaken their sins against you, and you've confronted them on it, you can hold a certain degree of unforgiveness, the same degree of unforgiveness God holds toward those still in sin against him. We're not called to a higher standard than God in this matter. But that degree of unforgiveness is not absolute hatred with no love. It's perfect hatred rooted in love with a longing for reconciliation. And it's not a murderous hatred. It's a very loving hatred. That may sound like a oxymoron, but it's not. God's all loving and he is love. And even his hatred is full of love underlying it and overcoming it. So when I say a degree of unforgiveness, what I mean is this. A total forgiveness is we are in right standing. We are now walking hand to hand in fellowship. The Bible says have no fellowship with darkness. The Bible says how can two walk hand in hand together unless they be agreed? You're not in that place if they're still practicing the sinful stuff and they're not repenting. They're hard hearted. So there is that degree of unforgiveness and separation. Do not be unequally yoked it doesn't just apply to marriage, it also applies to fellowship. We can't be yoked to and of one mind and one spirit with someone that's practicing evil if we're practicing truth and goodness and holiness. That would be an unequal yoking. Bad company corrupts good character. We're not supposed to keep company with people who are wicked in a sense. We can go to them evangelistically to speak truth and spend time with them to impart Christ to them, but we're not one with them, we're not of this world, and they are, then we're not one with them. 
we're called to be separate and come out from her, come out from the horror of Babylon, come out from people that are part of the worldly system and the Antichrist spirit, and they're not fully dedicated to the Lord. So, in those senses, there's a degree of quote-unquote unforgiveness, although we have forgiven them in this sense. We long for restitution and reconciliation. We are eager and willing to lay aside our, our wrongs that they did, that we're holding against them. We, we want to delete those wrongs. In some cases, we may be called to delete those wrongs, even when they haven't repented, preemptively knowing that eventually the Lord will break them and bring them to repentance. We can just let it slide, not, or not think about it. And that's healthy, just not, try not to think about it. But it's going to come up from time to time, and that's okay. We can tell them we pre-forgive them, or we forgive them, because it's, it's nuanced. You can say, I both forgive you and I don't forgive you on two sides of the coin. I forgive you in the sense that I care about you, and I love you still, and I want you to be healed from all the lies Satan's telling you, and I want you to be restored to right standing with the Lord and with his people. And So in that sense, I forgive you. I don't have a carnal unforgiveness, but I do have a spiritual unforgiveness in the sense that God himself has not forgiven you until you've confessed and forsaken your sins. You do not find mercy until then. Until you repent, which is to turn from your sins, you're still in them. And so if God has not forgiven you, I cannot forgive in the place of God on the spiritual level, on the level where I'm one with God in his heart. It says we have the mind of Christ. So if Christ is still angry with them, then I must, if I have Christ's mind, be angry with them in the same way that he is, with a perfect anger. Not a carnal, irrational, wicked anger, but a perfect and loving anger that longs for healing, longs for restoration for that person back into right standing. So it is nuanced. And you have to then decide, am I forgiving them in the right ways and not forgiving them in the right ways? in the two nuanced aspects and pictures of forgiveness slash unforgiveness that are painted in the Bible. Because it's not, it's not like there's only one side to the coin. This is a nuanced topic. The way I describe it, to make it simple, is this. I believe there's different levels of forgiveness. We're called to forgive for sure. If we don't forgive others, we will not be forgiven. We have to give certain degree of forgiveness for sure. Level one forgiveness, I'd say, is you get rid of any toxic feelings you have that are just going beyond what a spiritual person should feel. You rebuke that. So if you're saying, like, I just want to rip his head off, that's like, I rebuke that, no. I don't accept that type of unforgiveness. No. I want something good for this person. I want this person to be healed. I would cry for them that they're lost. I, I yearn for them to know the Lord. I yearn for them to see the truth. So that's level one forgiveness right there, that you have a love for them still. That's because like, if you have zero forgiveness, you have no love. You don't want them to come to, Lord, to know the Lord. You don't want them to have healing. You want them to burn and torment, literally. That's level zero forgiveness. You're not forgiving them at all. That's the kind the Bible is saying is carnal and hateful and murderous. So you want to at least get into level one forgiveness, which is loving with a, with a loving anger and a loving intolerance of the wickedness, but love abounding for them for sure. And then level two forgiveness is when both you and God wholly are reconciled to them. And you're of one mind, one heart, and you're yoked to them in peaceful harmony in Christ. They've repented of their sins. They're clean and made white as snow. And you as clean and white as snow in Christ are united again with them as brothers in Christ. That's level two forgiveness. We can't extend level two forgiveness for somebody who's still actively and openly rebelling against God and worshiping demons by, by their practice of their life of disobedience and wickedness toward others. 
that is a form of demon worship. So I think Christians sometimes feel like if I'm still angry with somebody, and if I don't respect the wickedness they're practicing, I'm not forgiving them and I'm sinning. I sense that is possibly the case with you, and I'm telling you that if you can see God as being angry with them for their sin, then you cannot be sinning for being angry with someone for their sin. If you can see someone being not yet forgiven by God because they haven't yet confessed and forsaken their sin, then in that sense, the spiritual sense of forgiveness and brought into right standing, you can still have that sense of unforgiveness as well. The Bible has conditions for God's forgiveness. He says, if you confess and forsake your sins, you shall find mercy. The Bible says, if my people who are called by name will humble themselves, that's one condition. Turn from their wicked ways, that's a second condition. Seek my face and pray, third and fourth condition. Then, and only then, God will hear from heaven. He will forgive their sins and he will heal their land, their heart. He'll heal their heart and give them a new heart and purify their heart. So there are those conditions. And if God has those conditions for his full and ultimate total forgiveness on the spiritual level, then so also must we, if we're abiding in him, we will have that same unforgiveness on the spiritual sense that he does, while all the while we'll have definitely the human level forgiveness, the Bible's talking about when it says to forgive, that level one forgiveness of loving them and longing for reconciliation and not having a murderous hatred. It can be a perfect and loving hatred, but not a murderous hatred. So you need to differentiate the types of hatred, the types of disdain, the types of intolerance, and rightly divide scripture on these topics. It's very key. So that having been said, I don't know your heart, I don't know the level of disdain, if it's a perfect and loving disdain, or if it's a hatred, murderous hatred disdain, or if it's a perfect loving hatred disdain. So that is up to you to decide, um, God, to reveal that to you and bring about the correct level of unforgiveness that you need in order to be forgiven by God and be in right standing with God. But you don't have to put this pressure on yourself to be in total perfect level 2 forgiveness through and through, um, where you feel totally peaceful toward that person in every sense, and totally reconciled and one with that person in every sense, when they're still actively your enemy and God's enemy. We're not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, what fellowship does light have with darkness? If we are abiding in the light and we are the light of the world, we're not having fellowship with wickedness and wicked unbelievers practicing wickedness and rebellion. We're not in spiritual communion with them. But we are to love them and long for them to be restored. So that, as I said, it's a complicated topic on forgiveness and it's not so black and white. So you say, obviously, that is sin. If, if the Lord is convicting you that you're in sin, that's one thing. But if you're being convicted that you're in sin toward your mother because of not fully understanding the level of forgiveness that we're called to, which I just helped clarify, I hope, then you may see that it, it is not necessarily obviously sin. It, it's not even sin at all. If you're still holding the same contempt God is holding, and God is not sinning and holding that contempt for the wicked, then neither are you. If you're in Christ and the same righteous anger burns in you that burns in him, then that means you're one with him. So you're supposed to have a degree of anger toward people doing wrongful things. If you hear that somebody's abusing a child and you don't have a righteous anger, then really you have, a, if you have a full acceptance of that and think it's perfectly fine to abuse a child or to harm children, then something's wrong there. So it's not necessarily a sin to have disdain for somebody that's practicing great wickedness. There should be a degree of disdain, even though love should be underlying that. And you should be willing to die for them, as well as a sign that you, you have a deep love for them. You would lay down your life if that meant that they would come to know the Lord through your sacrifice. You'd be willing. So you say, obviously that is a sin which I can't seem to heal from. And like I said, 
I don't know for sure if it's a sin in your case. You would have to rightly divide what's got what God's calling for in this instance. I'm hoping that maybe I could be setting you free from guilt for something that may be something God put in you, a anger for wickedness. That is not a carnal anger, but I don't know. It might be a carnal anger, in which case you would need to repent and at least get to that level one forgiveness I talked about. You say, if I die today, God forbid, based on your understanding, I will be cast into eternal, into eternal fire. So if you have a genuine level zero unforgiveness, that's hatred, murderous unforgiveness with no love at all there, and it's carnal, and it's unspiritual, and so you're holding that in your heart, and that's replacing total obedience and surrender to God in your heart, then yeah, if you don't, aren't wholly surrendered and obedient to God, then you're his enemy. You can't serve two masters. You would then be serving the God of this world. He that sins is of the devil. Okay, not to mention, you say, not to mention, I stress out about things in this life and often find myself not understanding slash questioning the situations Abba has been putting me through. Okay, well, having stress in this life, I believe, is natural. We can have physical stress and physical stress responses and hormonal releases, but if we're abiding in the Spirit, then you need to turn to your spirit. You need to get back in the spirit and rebuke your body when it's getting stress and, and tremors and things like that. Put your body under strict subjection so that after having preached to others, you yourself will not be disqualified. So your body can get stressed out, but you need to just rebuke your body. Realize your body is not you. If you're in the spirit, your body is a fallen foe. And make that body obey the spirit so your body can get stressed out but in order to calm your mind which is where the battlefield happens the bible says be anxious for nothing so you'll have the anxiousness but you hold that captive but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving or with thanksgiving make your requests known to god That his peace which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind. So the stress comes and you identify it. You hold it captive and you say, Lord, this is stressing me out. And I surrender that stress to you. I surrender the situation to you. I acknowledge you in it. And I ask that you, that I, I place this in your hand. I ask that you direct me in this that you handle this, that you bring about um, the healing, the correction, the, re the resolving of this matter, I put it in your hands. And if you want this matter to continue in the unhealthy state it is for a time in order to have certain things pan out and be exposed and darkness come to light through time and have our own backslidings of wickedness rebuke and reprove us and correct us, as the Bible says they will do, if for strategic reasons you're allowing that to go forward, then I will not lean on my own understanding, but I'll trust that you're going to bring about the working of what the enemy meant for evil, You that you will bring it to good. You will work all things out in your timing. And that you're playing 3D chess and I can't fully understand everything going on. But I surrender it to you and here's what I pray for according to my understanding. I pray for this, but I trust that you're going to do the right thing and bring about your ultimate will and the breaking and the surrender and the judgment and the punishment and the justice that needs to be done in the long haul. That you have things in your hands, that you're sovereign, that you're under control. I trust you're going to work all things out in your timing while still allowing for free will, which brings all kinds of chaos, but that you allow that as a gift to man out of love. So, that's what I would say as far as that. But I also have to mention that questioning situations God puts you through can be good as long as you're doing it with reverence. So like, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through this or that. 
you can search scripture and think about possible reasons why. And also in this matter, consider Job, perfect case study. He was experiencing afflictions, which he deemed to be not fair. He didn't understand it. And he started questioning God in an irreverent way, like, God, I don't think this is fair. Like, I'm kind of feeling like you're doing something messed up here to even allow me to be going through this. I don't get this. He was a little too questiony in a kind of irreverent matter-ish to a degree to the point where God had to rebuke him. Um, what he should have said is this, God gives and God takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going through a trial and a suffering and though I don't understand why fully at this moment, I trust that God has a reason for it, that's a good reason, and I do not question God's decision here to allow this. And taking it to an even deeper state of maturity, Job should have said, as the apostles understood, God, I thank you for this suffering, and I rejoice in it, because I know that in suffering, my faith is tested and shown to be approved and shown to be deep and of the heart. And that in these testings, I'm building character, perseverance, and hope. And so I rejoice in being tested. I rejoice in going through suffering. That's where growth happens. And it brings you glory, God, when a man who fears you and loves you is tested and that man passes the test. Satan's gambling. I know he's going to spit in God's face. I know he's going to turn on God as soon as the blessings are taken away. Satan scoffs and mocks at the righteous man, calling out the hollowness and the superficiality of the righteousness of that man, the superficiality of that man's love for God. But if that man's love for God is deeper than Satan realizes... And that man will fear God and obey God and praise God, even in the midst of that type of trial, proving Satan to be wrong about that man. Proving to Satan, wow, this guy's love goes deeper than I thought. This man really fears God, really trusts God, really loves God. And even in the midst of his trial, he's praising God the entire time with complete faith and trust. Man, I look like a fool. I did not see this coming. This guy, he has a love for God that transcends what I believed was possible in a man. And then that gives God glory because God is worthy of that love. And if that love for God is found in a man, that is evidence of how worthy God is of our love. And so that brings God glory when men love God to that degree, even in the midst of their suffering. So Job should have been realizing this was an opportunity to shine for God to bring God glory and to express his love for God by trusting God completely, even when he couldn't fully understand what was going on. And that is a key takeaway from the book of Job and a key lesson that applies in this scenario we're talking about here in your comment. One thing we do know is this. We can rejoice in all sufferings and in trials and persecutions of many kinds because they build in us persecution perseverance, character, and hope. So we can rejoice in our sufferings knowing that the Lord's trying to help us to grow. I know that you have a, a great desire and drive to get to know God and to grow spiritually. And you probably have prayed, Lord, I want to grow. I want to come to a deeper understanding of you. I want to be built up man of God. I want to be mature in you. And if you pray for that, know that God is answering your prayer if he brings trials and sufferings and refining by fire. That's where the growth happens, by refining through fire. Know that that's how God operates. If you pray for patience, he's going to bring situations that are very frustrating and stressful that require tremendous patience to survive. He's, if you pray for long-suffering, he's going to bring situations that bring you suffering so that you become long-suffering, able to handle and be patient and slow to anger in situations that are very frustrating. The fully built up mature man of God 
is built up because of many sufferings and trials that he's put through. It makes you a warrior. It's like training. It's like boot camp. It's like a hazing to get into a fraternity. you got to go through the hazing to show and prove your faith and your dedication and your love for him. He'll put you through fires and trials where your faith can shine, where you can overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will lead you into the wilderness to be tempted. And while in that wilderness, he will call on you to overcome every temptation and to find that way out that he provides for each temptation. If you read or watch the film Pilgrim's Progress, you see that it's a battle. The journey of the Pilgrim of Christ is a battle. And you have many opportunities to turn back and fall away. But it's he that perseveres to the end that shall be saved. It's a battle to the finish. It's a narrow road that few find. You have to strive to enter by the narrow gate. There's a, a hard work that has to happen to enter by the narrow gate. It's hard. The way is narrow and hard and difficult and few find it. You will face many enemies. You will have to get that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, bloody in battle against principalities and powers and everything that's going to come against you in this life. You need to learn to use that full armor of God and that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to vanquish all of your foes and to stand firm and to be victorious. If you want to stand firm in Christ, you're going to get covered in blood of your enemies, which can mean loving your enemies that sheds a lot of blood. That destroys them. It's like pouring heaping coals on their head. You fight by love above all. And speaking the very oracles of God into every situation, bringing truth. Truth is that sword. It's a spiritual battle. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty for pulling down strongholds. We tear down every argument. We hold every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I ruminate on depressive thoughts sometimes, you say. Um, that's okay. We are to ruminate on everything now granted, it says whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is true, whatever is noble, think on such things. And darker things are not that, so we're not to think about it all the time, but we can address evils or we can address Satan's devices because we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. We can think about them with God and ask God questions about it. Why does this happen? Why does this happen? How did this happen? And search for meaning, search for answers, search for truth, search for how God uses various things that happen that are negative to bring about the humbling of man, to bring about the exposing of the darkness of man, exposing the darkness with God's light. He uses many things. He allows many things to to happen in order to work with man under the confines of free will. If he could just switch a button and nobody has free will and everybody just automatically is forced to obey God and love God, then that would make us all robots. So he has to work within the confines of still allowing free will. And that becomes a delicate and nuanced task that God takes on. It's not so simple then. Generally speaking, we want to just be thinking about really positive stuff as much as possible. But when we're spending time with God seeking understanding, we can dig into some negative things. The Bible talks about negative and dark things at times as well. When you're reading the Bible, you hear about the whoredoms of the people. You hear about the wickedness of a people. It describes it. Um, so there is a time and place for that for the purpose of instruction and in learning and in coming before God to ask about these things and why they're happening. But we don't delight in them. We don't think about them any more than is necessary for what is beneficial and edifying. And deep things of life are, 
can have a lot of depressive aspects to it. We ruminate that, and we ruminate on it with the Lord, though. We ask Him about it. We search it. We think about how Scripture applies to it. We look at it from all the different angles. We try to understand. The Bible says the mature man of God will test and approve His perfect will. We need to see how He's using the enemy for the destruction of the flesh that people's souls might be saved on the Lord's day. Paul delivered people over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. We need to think about how God uses Satan to destroy people. He brings out the evil that's already in their heart, provokes them to act on it, and that, then it gets exposed, and then they feel guilty. It's all meant to humble men. If men have evil hearts, but they never do anything bad, their evil is never going to be put on display enough to really convict them and bring about that great godly sorrow that brings about repentance, change, and reconciliation to the Lord. So Satan just fans the flames of their own evil, causing them to act out on the evil that's already there, the rebellion and the resisting God that's already in hearts. He brings it to full manifestation that man might be ashamed of themselves. And it breaks the man. In God's timing, God brings all the unfruitful works of darkness to light. And it breaks men, and it destroys their pride and their ego, and it destroys their rebellion, and it makes them just a whimpering puppy, humbled in the sight of God. And in that place, God's power can be made strong. When we are weak, His power is made strong and perfect in us. Because only in humility can God exalt a man. God exalts us after we've humbled ourselves, but he cannot exalt us when we still hold rebellion in our hearts. So Satan has that purpose. That's why he's allowed to come out one last time after the thousand year period to tempt the nations one last time. He is playing a certain role. So ruminating on the depressive thoughts is good. I watch, correction, ruminating on depressive thoughts is good if it's done for the express purpose of coming to a deeper understanding testing and approving god's perfect will and seeking understanding on why he allows certain things to happen for the purpose of edification and a deeper understanding of reality and of how god is working taking the case of joseph for example why did god allow his brothers to cast him into a pit and then sell him into slavery we ended up seeing that he saved the whole nation of Israel as the Pharaoh's right-hand man and all the things that God used in that. So God used a wicked thing to bring about good. And so finding those underlying silver linings behind things can be good. That could be a reason to ruminate on some depressive things to find that silver lining, to understand deeper why God's allowing this and to think about that. While all the while trusting God has everything in control and he is sovereign, and he is playing 3D chess, and he is excellent, and he's amazing, and he wants good, ultimately, for everybody. Um, YouTube channels that expose the enemy, what they're doing in music videos, what they're doing with the Illuminati, and promoting that to kids on t-shirts and stuff. That's depressive to think about. But Paul says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're to be wise as serpents, but innocent as lambs. We can ruminate on dark things happening in this world and think about why does God allow this and test and approve God's perfect will. Understand how he uses everything. He uses the good and the bad to bring about the humility and the breaking of man's rebellion. He's a 3D chess strategist and a brilliant mastermind. He has, it's very, it goes very deep. And it's, it's actually good to think about this, but to never doubt God has things figured out and he's got a plan and that he's going to work everything out in the end. He's going to make everything okay. He's going to bring about the ends that he wants to bring about. And he, he means for good. In the end, he's going to bring a happy ending. He will be victorious. Every knee will bow. All who raged against him will come to him, ashamed. He will bring about the breaking of the pride of man and angel. He will destroy all 
opposition. And he's he's doing that always. He's always working. He is destroying his enemies. Always. You say, I find myself not being able to love thy neighbor to a proper biblical standard when I work around agonizingly annoying lifelong alcoholics. You know, I thought if I'm to love my neighbor to a biblical standard, if my wife is disrespectful or rude, that I'm to just keep a super gentle tone like, baby, that was very rude. But the Lord was like, you brood of hypocrites. He, he, was, he was angry. Anger is not wrong. Strong rebuking is not always necessarily wrong. Um, you have to have wisdom and self-control. Peter says, strive to add to your faith self-control. So, that could be an area you need work in. Um, but if you fall short and you feel convicted on how you treated your neighbor, then repent and, and get back up and just keep striving to add to your faith self-control. And to tame your tongue. If you can tame your tongue then you can bridle your whole body. Now a man cannot do this, but by the power of God it can be done. All things are possible for those who believe. We can have our tongues tamed. One way to help with that is to take a deep breath, to acknowledge God before we speak, especially when we're being triggered by coworkers or wicked people or our wife or whatever that are making us angry. Take a breath, Pause. Be slow to speak, the Bible says. So pause before you speak, especially when you're angry. Acknowledge the Lord. Acknowledge your love for Him. Just quickly, in your mind, acknowledging Him. Maybe even say, Oh Lord Jesus, cover me, Lord. In your head. Or out loud. And then acknowledge that you love your neighbor. That's the first command. Love the Lord your God. So you're acknowledging and loving Him. It's just to think of Him. First command. Second command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So remind yourself, I love them. Then speak. After fulfilling the first and second commandment quickly, being slow to speak, then speak to this person that's being carnal, wicked, and making you angry. Um, it's agonizingly annoying. I agree. That's understandable. It should be. Um, but taking that pause, and then if you still um, feel led to a strong rebuke or whatever, Jesus was dumping tables and stuff. He could be a strong rebuker at times. Um, so you're not necessarily sinning when you're getting angry and rebuking somebody. You don't always have to have a super gentle, meek tone of voice either. There, there's times when the Holy Spirit with you can be angry and you can speak in an angry manner. Um, when somebody's being sinful and you're calling out sin and you're telling the truth. But... You want to have self-control even in that and love even in that. It can never be devoid of self-control and love. You need to be prudent and restrained even when in that angry rebuke mode. So that's something that requires discipline and it may take you time to master it. So it's possible maybe to even flee temptation if you feel you are going to respond carnally. You should even be very slow to speak. As one, one thing you can do is wait a long time after somebody asks you a question or says something. Literally like count to five if you need to. To allow yourself to calm down. Take a couple deep breaths. Pray. And, and acknowledge you love them. And you want them to know the Lord. And you are Christ's representative then speak. That should help you a lot. That's what the Lord taught me to do, to help me in that area. Because I was struggling with my tone of voice and kind of just responding a little too quick, a little too bitter in my tone. And it could be improved on. That, When you improve on that, the Lord's pruning you so that you can bear more fruit. Okay.
You say, I've been watching all of your videos, bro, and I appreciate the long-form discussions you put up on here, despite not believing what you believe regarding the qualities one must have to be considered a child of God. I appreciate you watching and considering and enjoying the videos, and that's okay if you don't uh, believe everything I believe. Um, I could be not explaining it as well as I should, or I could not be understanding it perfectly, and I'm open to correction. Um, or, potentially, you haven't been given the full revelation on some of those aspects. And then, there is another thing of note, which is this. The Bible does say that all men are children of God in a sense. All men are. Because he's the creator. We have the fact that God created Adam and Eve, and all of us descended from them. So even in that sense, if he's the father of all of creation, he's everyone's father. In that sense, in the brotherhood of man type of sense. We also have the example of the father and his sons, one becoming a prodigal son, and then the elder brother um, didn't like that the prodigal son was forgiven by the father and celebrated when he came home. But the prodigal son is still a son. He's a prodigal son, but a son nonetheless. So also, all men are sons in the sense that they're prodigals or non-prodigals, but they're all sons in a sense. But then, on the spiritual level, we're not all children of God in the sense of, are we... Currently, while sinning, children of God on a spiritual level? No, on a spiritual level, we're children of the devil while we're being bad. When we're being good and obeying God and filled with the Spirit, then we're children of God, spiritually speaking. But everybody, in some sense, is a child of God in a sense. And as far as us all being children of God in some sense, you can see here, Psalm 82.6 I have said you are God's, lowercase g, you are all sons of the Most High, lowercase s. But like mortals you will die, and like rulers you will fall. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. And this is speaking also about people who are not fully built up manifest sons of God in the spiritual sense. Because if you look at 80, Psalms 82, verse 5, it says, They do not know or understand. So these are people that are ignorant that it's talking about. They wander in the darkness. This is people who are lost, spiritually dead. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. The very next verse, I have said you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, but like mortals you will die, and like rulers you will fall. This is talking about all men. All have sinned and fallen short and fall short of the glory of God. And so, although we are made in God's image, at times, while we are in sin and in darkness and spiritually dead, we do not know or understand, we wander in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. But, despite that, we are sons of the Most High in the sense that we were created in His image, and... He is actively, presently, and always perpetually working to reconcile man to himself. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. The bottom line is, spiritually speaking, though everyone's a child of God in the general sense, spiritually th speaking, we're not a child of God when we're not abiding in him and right standing with him obeying him and this type of idea actually is even used in playful banter in human terms or in worldly terms when let's say a little kid burps at the supper table and the mom rolls her eyes and says that's your son she's teasing her husband then suggesting that he's also a slob at the dinner table and burps in front of people and lacks manners. She's being teasing. But to say he's your son, it's like saying that 
the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So it's an insult to God to call someone who's in the flesh and walking according to the flesh a son of God. Although technically they're created in God's image, they're not reflecting that. And so they're called in a disparaging way a child of Satan as a rebuke, as an insult to that person who is manifesting Satan on the spiritual level. So when you say child of, it's referring to which entity are you modeling right now? If you're modeling God because you're abiding in the Spirit and obeying God, the Bible refers to as a child of God. If you're modeling Satan because you're walking according to the flesh, obeying its lusts, you're called a child of Satan. So when you're in the spiritual state of mind, walking according to the Spirit, you have the right to consider yourself a child of God. When you're walking according to the flesh and sinning, the Bible rebukes you and calls you a child of the devil. It's a rebuke. Even though everyone technically is a child of God in the sense that he is the father of all creation. So in a sense, everybody's a child of God. Even in a sense, everyone believes in God, although the Bible speaks of unbelievers. It's people that by their life profess unbelief. They're called an unbeliever, especially if they are not even actively seeking after God. Um, but many people are considered or call themselves believers while still not abiding in Christ and obeying him. So by their works, they deny him. They call him Lord, Lord, and he asks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I command? He's exposing that he's not truly your Lord if you're not serving him as Lord, and instead you're serving sin as your Lord. And also, um, as far as, you know, the qualities one must have to be considered a child of God, I, I get a lot of that from 1 John. It says, it says this, 1 John 3.10, And this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. So this is how they are shown. This is how you can tell who is a child of God or who is a child of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So that means if you're not practicing righteousness, but instead you're sinning, then you're of the devil at that moment. So that's one qualification of showing you're a child of God is you're practicing righteousness. And the Bible says he that practices righteousness is righteous, even as he, Jesus that is, is righteous. The one that practices sin is of the devil. So when you sin, you're of the devil. And the Bible says specifically, he that sins is of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So, if you are not loving your brother at all, you're not of God, you're of Satan. Now, can you hate your brother that's currently actively rebelling against God in the sense that God hates them? Well, yes, if God hates them, it's not a sin. You can hate them in a sense which is, as I went through exhaustively before, you hate them in the sense of hating the sins they're practicing, you're hating what they're representing, you're hating the contents of their heart, which is full of cherishing of iniquity, you're hating the works that are coming out of them. From the evil treasure in their evil heart are coming forth evil things. You're hating the evil tree. But you're loving who they were created to be. We were all created by him and for him. We're loving them in the sense that they have created value. That they were created to worship him. And they will worship him in God's timing. They will be brought to that place. You're loving that they have, they were made in Christ's image. In God's image they were made. And so you're loving them in the sense that they have the capacity to express their creator being made in his image. So you're loving them for who they can be and who they will be. Calling something in your mind, calling forth a hopeful picture of them 
and loving that picture of them, a future them that they're called unto. And so they'll, although they are evil now, the future then that God will create when he destroys their rebellion and he destroys their pride and he destroys their evil hearts and gives them a new heart, we're loving that future them and we're practicing that in advance by showing them love even now while they're still yet sinners. And that's the same thing Jesus did. While the world was yet sinners, Christ died for us. He saw what we could be as manifest sons of God, though we were not yet that. He saw it in his foreknowledge. And so he loved us because he knows what we can be. It's just like the prodigal son. He's gone, but the father knows eventually he will come home. And so he still loves the son, knowing who that son once was and who that son will someday be. But right now he is dead to him and he's spiritually dead and he's lost. But he leaves the 99 for that one lost sheep, longing for that sheep to come back. And he'll chase that sheep down until it's found. And that is the same attitude we should have. So that's why we love them, because we know that they were once good as innocent babies, and they will one day in the future be good again once the Lord breaks their rebellion and shows them that he is Lord, and they acknowledge that and they worship him. So that's the love we can have even for someone that's our enemy. Although we will despise them as enemies of God in another sense. So I'll be touching on that all the time. I, I bring that up a lot. It's meant to bring conviction and a soberness about how much God hates sin and how much he sees the devil when we're sinning. He sees us being like a child of the devil. Also, when someone's called a child of the devil, it doesn't mean literally the devil's a co-creator with God and he created that person from the foundations of the earth. There was Adam and Eve, then there were devil children, and there's still devil children now coming from that seed. It's not like that. Nor does it mean that Satan literally procreated with your mother and created you, and that's why you're a child of the devil, because Satan's literally your father, you're born of his seed, and you're one of the Nephilim. No, it's not that either. It's not literal in that sense. It's just that when you sin, you are considered, biblically speaking, to be of your father, the devil, because you're doing rebellion. All sin is rebellion. Um... If it's a willful sin, of course. And Satan representing the king of all rebels, you're called a father of that king because you're doing sinning just like that king is all about sinning. It's not like you're literally his son now. Just spiritually speaking and categorically speaking, you're placed into that camp because you're acting like that camp. You're manifesting that camp's same rebellion. Even though some part of us knows it's wrong, we're still doing the wrong, and that's what God hates. Some part of us, especially if we're seeking after God, some part of us does love him to a degree, but when we choose to sin over him, Jesus himself says, you're loving the one you obey. When you're obeying the flesh, leading you to sin against God, and you're choosing to do what the flesh is telling you to do instead of what God's telling you to do, you are telling God you love the flesh more than him when you're doing that. He says you will you can't serve two masters. You'll either love one and despise the other. So when you sin, you love your sin more than God. Even though you may have some degree of love for God, you're loving the sin more. You're not willing to lay it down for him. But as I've said before, especially some of the stuff we're talking about in this comment, some things that you may be feeling that you think are a sin are not even necessarily a sin. With the level 1, level 2 forgiveness type of stuff. And I know that's not expressly talked about level one forgiveness, level two forgiveness, that's not in the Bible. And yet, 
we're building that precept upon precept based on biblical foundations and ideas and lessons that we see throughout the Bible that there is an aspect of God hating wickedness and hating sinners. The Bible says he, he hates sinners. He hated Esau. God despises even the sacrifices of sinners who aren't doing it for him. They're really doing it just to look good. Okay, you go on. I'm just not prideful enough to cast everyone I ever known, especially, essentially, into the pit because I'm a more perfect special boy. Ir okay, so we do know that the vast majority of people are cast into the pit and are even now, in a sense, in the pit. A any separation from God is as the pit. Only when we're alive in Christ are we not in the pit. Are we actually said to be seated with him in heavenly places? And so if by our logic we say anyone we deem to be heading for hell according to the Bible, we are throwing into the pit and throwing many people into the pit is an indication of our own pride. Then following that same logic, if we were to say nobody's going to the pit, that would indicate we're the ultimate picture of humility. And so we would tell everyone, even while street preaching, you're all heading for heaven. Jesus accepts you just the way you are in your sin. No one's going to the pit. And that would be the epitome of humility. But in truth, that would be the epitome of just denying scripture and giving a license for sin false humility, self-righteousness, and acting as a deceiver and false teacher. That would be all that is. Everyone that's not seated with him in heavenly places presently is already in a sense in a pit of separation from God, of inner turmoil, of something's missing inside. Um, so this is a present reality and a future reality which will be manifest in a powerful way. And it's not prideful to acknowledge these truths, nor is it prideful for God to execute these judgments upon his enemies. If I acknowledge what God's doing to his enemies, that's not proud, necessarily. Although it could be proud in some cases, if people are misunderstanding it or having the wrong spirit and the wrong heart when they're talking about it. Like when somebody tells someone, go to hell, and they have a hatred that's a murderous hatred, and they really want them to never know God. That could be a prideful thing, for sure. I, I see what you're saying. Um, and what you say about, I'm a more perfect special boy as well, that can be pride, or that can be acknowledging I'm perfect in Christ. And the Bible speaks about being perfect in Christ. And we can't say, I am that because I did something. We would also say, he refined me, he called me, and he worked in me to bring me to this place of humility and moral perfection in Christ. Nothing I did, I didn't choose him, he chose me. In a sense, we did it together, but he was the initiator and he was the powerful majority power and presence and worker in this relationship. Though I did submit, though I did surrender, he brought me to that place of surrender. So he gets all the glory. So then there's no pride when we stand seated with Christ. We stand firm and right standing with Christ. Because if we boast, we boast in the Lord. He did it all. He paid the price. He called us. He chose us. He brought us the victory by his power. He gave us the gift of faith. So much of everything that we can attain to, all goes credit to him, even though he rewards us 
for having been a willing, using our free will, we were still a willing participant in that process of coming to know him and abide in him, and then standing firm and diligently seeking him. There is things that we do, we're called to do, to strive, to diligently seek. So there is an aspect of synergy with both of us working together, both God and man work together in this transformation work. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're prideful. And in fact, if we do have pride about it, a carnal pride, rather than a pride in the Lord alone, then clearly that transformation work has not occurred. It's only been some kind of mental transformation to a degree, but we're not in Christ if we have any pride. To be in Christ, you have to necessarily be humble as a prerequisite. There's no such thing as a proud man with a carnal pride abiding in Christ. That's the, the pride of life and the pride of man is rebellion in itself. You can't say, I'm in rebellion against Christ while abiding in Christ. That's a deception. And to support that, we have anyone that claims to abide in him must walk even as Jesus walked. So there is no such thing as rebelling while abiding in Christ. Irregardless, you say, I love you and I will pray for you, bro. God is amazing despite my flaws that I pray he heals me from. He that hungers and seeks after righteousness will be satisfied. So that prayer will be gratified in God's timing. And a lot of the flaws, which may or may not be sin flaws, but just still remnants of bad habits and whatnot from a past life of sin, um, God can burn away through the fires of trials. God is a consuming fire. And he will burn away all flaws in you, pruning you so that you'll bear more fruit. If you continue to seek after him diligently, these are the rewards he'll give you. More suffering, that's your reward. But that suffering is something you're to rejoice in because you know it produces a new character, perseverance, and hope. And whatever flaws that you hate, when those flaws are removed, that's character replacing it. Your character will grow. And it can never be finished growing. We can all have deeper and greater character. So in other words, even if we're perfect in Christ because we're in the Spirit, we still don't have a perfect character in every sense. We still don't have perfect fruits of the Spirit on full display in every sense because we can always get improvements on character and improvements on expression of the gifts or the fruits of the Spirit. So no one's ever fully, fully perfect in every sense. But the Bible speaks of being perfect in the sense of having the self-control to reign in your tongue and reign in your body in order to be able to obey the Lord perfectly according to your current level of understanding. And so, in other words, to have moral perfection of the heart. Doesn't mean you have a perfect mind, doesn't mean you have a perfect body, doesn't mean you have perfect character or perfect demonstration of the fruits of the Spirit at every moment. It just means you're walking in moral perfection to the best of your ability and knowledge. You continue, based on your interpretations, I am going to burn in the pits despite believing on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, putting my faith in his workings rather than anything of my own, and letting his spirit lead in any of the numerous interactions I have with unbelievers on the daily basis at work. We know that faith without works is dead, according to James. And so, James says even the, believe, even the demons believe and tremble, but faith without works is dead. So, if you believe something, the Bible says everyone knows God. It says God makes himself plain to them. Although they knew God, they neither worshipped God nor gave thanks to God. So just knowing 
doesn't separate the wheat from the chaff. It's knowing and putting that knowing to practice. If we are a hearer of God's word and we know it to be true, but we don't do what the word says to do, then it's why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet do not do what I say? So really, we are judged according to our works. And the key between who is accepted and who is rejected at the point in which they die and face him, what I teach is if you die in Christ, you're accepted because you had your wedding clothes on, you were ready. If you died not in Christ, but instead in the flesh, then you died as God's enemy. A Christian can be in the flesh at times and in the spirit at other times, according to my understanding. When you're in the flesh, you need to be fearful, because if you die in that place, you're going to die in a state of rebellion. And when you come to face him, you'll find you're not wearing your wedding clothes, you'll be dragged out. See, they sit down at this wedding feast thinking, man, I, I've loved God my whole life and I've done so much for him. But if they walk in naked, not wearing Christ, not having their wedding garments on, everyone can see it but them. They think they're wearing their wedding garments, but they're not. They were in the flesh. Bible says the flesh cannot please God. The mind of the flesh is at enmity with God. Those who walk according to the flesh or are in the realm of the flesh do not have the Spirit of God in them and they do not belong to Christ. So a Christian can at times be in the flesh and not belong to Christ and not have the Spirit of Christ in them. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. But if you abide in him, and remain in him, he will remain in you. The choice is yours. It comes down to guarding your heart. For from it flows the issues of life. One of the great lies of the false teachers is that once in him, always in him. Which is pure folly. Sure, it's possible to remain in him and thereby never sin again. Go and sin no more. But that's not a foregone conclusion. That re requires persistence of standing firm, which most Christians do not do. So they're not always remaining in him. You have to remain in him, and he will remain in you. He doesn't remain in you if you don't remain in him. How can he be in you when you're not in him? And how can you say you're abiding in him while you're not walking as Jesus walked? The Bible says anyone that claims to abide in him must walk as Jesus walked. If you're in him, you're following him. If you're following him, you're not being led into sin because he doesn't lead you into sin. So you're following the flesh if you sin. You're following Christ if you're obeying. If you're following Christ, that means you're in Christ. It's possible to stop being in Christ and instead follow the flesh. When you're following the flesh, you're not in Christ. These are very basic things that the false teachers want to twist. They'll say, no, your spirit's in Christ even while you're following after the flesh. Your spirit's saved even though your flesh is not. Your spirit's obeying God even though you are sinning. This is all dualism. It's all Gnosticism. It's all false teachings that have been condemned throughout the New Testament. A lot of 1 John is all about exposing those types of false teachings. We would not be commanded by Jesus multiple instances, remain in me, and I will remain in you. That would be a foregone conclusion. Pure folly to even mention, if it were impossible not to remain in him. Of course it's possible to sometimes return to following after the flesh. And the Bible warns us about that all the time. So remaining in him is not a gimme, it's not a automatic. And him remaining in us, then, therefore, is not an automatic. Him remaining in us has the condition of us remaining in him. You can't be in one another 
and then you depart from him, and now you're in the realm of the flesh, and he follows you there, remaining in you anyways, while you're in the realm of the flesh. That's folly. He doesn't enter the realm of the flesh with you. When you're in the spirit, you need to guard your heart with the full armor of God, with the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the boots of readiness, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, mighty for pulling down strongholds, holding every thought captive to obedience to Christ, not letting that thought pass the courtroom of your mind and enter into your heart, spoiling you, causing you to cherish iniquity in your heart, and when you cherish iniquity in your heart, God will not hear your prayers. If you're cherishing iniquity of the, in your heart because you're in the flesh, you're in the realm of the flesh, you're cherishing iniquity in your heart, and God will look right at your heart and judge you according to your heart when you come to face him if you die in that state, and he will say, I never knew you, because he's looking at a heart loving sin. That's not a heart he knows. He's only knowing and one with a heart that loves him above all and hates sin. So when you're in the flesh and you're loving and serving sin, you are his enemy. He's not going to let his enemies into the wedding feast to feast with him. You have to first repent to get in. And as I've said many times, this people burning in the pits, we've just got this Milton, Dante's Inferno, Mickey Mouse, Disney silly ridiculous idea that it's going to be literally never ending that's unbiblical it's metaphorically everlasting fire it's metaphorical fire the Lord is mercy he will not cast anyone off forever because the Lord is merciful he will restore all things he will reconcile himself to everyone and everything Every knee will bow. So, throwing someone in the pits because they died as his enemy, they died in the flesh, not dying in living faith, practicing what they believe and profess. That's all meant to break them and bring them to repentance. That's all meant to reconcile himself to them. The pits are just a correctional place. It's not meant to be the Omega, which means the ending. It's a means to an end, and He is the end. God will be in all things. God will be all in all. God will be all things in everyone. He will be everyone's world. He will be everyone's life. He will eventually fill everyone with Himself. This is all prophesied, and none of those prophecies can be true if you read the pits being literally never-ending and literal fire. God is the consuming fire of the pits. And that's a fire that is filled with God's love and correction. That is the fire that destroys the flaws of man. That's a fire that every believer in Christ should be walking in, getting perfected while they're in him, getting all of their flaws burned away. So we can believe in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The demons all believed the Lord Jesus Christ died. He revealed himself as God a million times. They believed it happened. They watched it. They mocked the whole time. Um, what matters is that you believe in that, and then you walk in that reality by living your whole life unto him and having nothing come before him. Loving him with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength. When you're in the flesh, you're loving the world with, let's say, 90% of your heart or at least 51%. Because think about it. Whatever the majority of your heart is loving... That's what it's going to do. If you love the Lord with all of your heart, you would not sin. If you love the Lord with 30% of your heart or 49% of your heart, you're going to be sinning because you love sin a little more. And that's what Jesus taught about you'll love one, despise the other. If you love me, you will keep my commands. 
Why? Because if you're loving him with all of your heart, as you're commanded, from that love you'll hate sin, and you'll love his things more, and you'll choose him instead each time you're tempted. So, we can believe intellectually in what the Lord did on the cross. But, if you believe that with all of your heart, and you're walking in that revelation and reality, then while you're walking in that revelation of reality, you will be obeying while you're walking in it. Things you believe in, you can forget. The Bible describes that as a man looking at himself in the mirror and then forgetting once he walks away. As his analogy or his parable, describing what it is to forget what you're professing to believe and to then, in your works, deny him. You can by your mouth profess faith and then by your works deny your own profession. That's when your faith is dead. When your works do not line up with what you're claiming. You want to prove your faith by your works. God is saying, I'm from Missouri. I'm from the show me state. You claim it, I want to see you walk it. Otherwise, you're claiming it is vain. It's pointless and empty to me. Why do you do all these religious festivals and all these feast days and Sabbaths and all these holy things and yet you don't give justice to the poor and yet you don't love your neighbor? I would rather have you do one. I would rather see justice being done than see you guys all gathering in my name but not doing what I love to see you doing, not being good to one another, not being loving. So God is big time into seeing us First and foremost, practicing what we preach. Otherwise, we're a hypocrite. And he despises hypocrisy. He wants to see us walk the walk. It says that if you claim to abide in him, you must walk as Jesus walked. You're not abiding in him if you're not walking as Jesus walked. So you say you're putting your faith in his workings rather than anything of your own. And letting his spirit lead. So, if you're putting your faith in his workings, which happens both during his ministry and he's always working, mind you, and he should be working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. If you're putting your faith in those workings, which happens in you and he's always working, then these perpetual, never ending workings, not finished workings, but continued workings, that you're putting your faith in would then be manifest in your walk if you're truly putting all of your faith in that. If you're putting only part of your faith in that and some of your faith in the things of this world and in doubts or whatever, then that's going to be reflected by still sinning. So that means you're a ye of little faith and you need to practice more faith in that. Um, You'll find another great lie of the false teachers is that when Jesus says it is finished, God was revealing that he's no longer going to work. Period. Also, that when Jesus said it is finished, he was saying all efforts by men or angels to obey God is finished. No one needs to obey God anymore because I did it perfectly. Now everyone has a license to sin from here forward because I paid the price for it and my blood gives everyone a license to sin. So put my blood upon you and then sin with impunity and I will smile upon it. Now we can all delight in sin because we can do it and get away with it. This is the most wicked false teaching imaginable. It creates a provision for the flesh, and it uses God's grace as licentiousness. It's pure evil. And a tremendous amount, even the majority of teachers of God's word, teach this very thing. Leading many to hell. Now when you say, I, I don't put faith in my own workings, now we're getting into the works debate and as you must know there are a difference between works of the flesh 
works of the law, which go hand in hand, and works of faith, by grace through faith works. Faith working by love. If you have faith working by love, then that's a living faith. It's a faith that's working. And a faith working by love will not have a fruit of unrighteousness. It will have a fruit of faith and righteousness. It won't have a fruit of sin. Faith working by love is manifest by obedience. And letting his spirit lead, so again, if you're letting his spirit lead, his spirit's not going to lead you to sin. It's going to lead you to obedience. In any of the numerous interactions. So you say you're letting his spirit lead in any of the numerous interactions, and yet you also say you're not sure if you're handling the interactions correctly. Try to find your exact wording there. I find myself not able to love my neighbor to a proper biblical standard when I work around agonizingly annoying lifelong alcoholics. But then you say you are letting his spirit lead in these numerous interactions. So then I see a contradiction. On the one hand, you say you're letting his spirit lead, which would produce the loving thy neighbor biblically that the Lord smiles upon. But then in another sense you say I'm not loving my neighbor as the Bible would have me do. Which means you're not letting the spirit lead but you're letting your flesh lead. And the Bible says that he that walks after the flesh is sowing to de reap destruction. He that sows to the flesh reaps destruction. He that sows to the spirit reaps eternal life. Flesh cannot please God while you walk after the flesh. You're not pleasing God, and you're God's enemy when your mind is set on the things of the flesh. So, you are contradicting yourself to say you're letting his spirit lead in your interactions and then saying your interactions are falling short of the standard the Lord calls you to. His spirit wasn't leading, then your flesh was leading. Um... And what I want to do is to teach you how to follow the leading of the Spirit in a way that manifests itself with the fruits of the Spirit in those numerous interactions in such a way that you can look upon and reflect on those interactions with a confidence and a boldness and say, I handled that in a way that was spiritual and pleasing to God. That's where I want you to get, and that's what God expects of us. You go on. I have, okay, interactions I have with unbelievers on a daily basis at work. Okay, so that that's what the interactions we were talking about. Okay. You continue. I give all my praise to him and always give him the glory for anything good that I've ever done. That's good. That's correct. That's what we must do. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of Lights, comes from God above. And so every good thing that we do has been Him working in or through us. Now that's if it's truly good and untainted. Because Satan can appear as an angel light and do good things. Like the Illuminati will give to charity, but it's all to get their name in the newspaper to hide their sins and make them feel even more proud of themselves. So if it was truly good and selfless and done a spiritual manner, then yes, that was from the Lord. But if it was good in a tainted way, then that was not from the Lord. That was that could have been still something quote-unquote good that was done just to glorify the self like the Pharisees would do. Praying out loud is something good. Praying out loud in the streets just to be noticed and praised by men, that's not good. It's like good but tainted. So it's not um, going to test the fires when all of our works are tested. That would be a quote-unquote good work that ends up being shown to be chaff or hay or stubble. It, it wasn't precious rubies or gold. It, it will be shown to have had a tainted motivation behind it. Okay. Yet I will cast down into hell for still holding... Yet I will be cast down into hell for still re holding resentment for my own 
overly evil, overtly evil mother. Um, so like I said, one thing that should really help with that, I, I don't want to give a license for a carnal resentment, but I want to give a biblical picture of a godly resentment. Does God resent those who are doing wickedly? Did he resent the people whose every imaginations of the heart were continuously evil, such that he actually said, I repent of having made man. I resent having made man. I want to destroy them all. Um, but he saved Noah, because Noah is a perfect man. Perfect in his generations, Noah walked with God. I just looked up the definition of resentment. Because you said you have resentment. Resentment says bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. Was that not exactly what God was experiencing when he looked upon his creation and men were all acting so unjustly and treating God with contempt by ignoring his laws, ignoring his goodness, ignoring his blessings, spitting in his face every time they sinned and rebelled against him? Very much was he bitter and in indignation, which means anger. God is wrathful in that type of situation. He, he destroyed the whole earth in the flood as an expression of that resentment. Here Wikipedia says resentment is a complex, multi-layered emotion, and God has emotions. He, we are made in his image. That has been described as a mixture of disappointment. Was God disappointed with man? Yes, absolutely, very much so. Disgust, was God disgusted with man? Yes, God is very disgusted with great wickedness. Anger, does God become angry with wicked men? Yes, and fear. Now, I don't believe God fears men. So that is one that, first of all, I don't even know why resentment has to include fear. I don't even agree with that being included in the definition of the emotions involved. Resentment doesn't necessarily mean fear. I can resent my child's wicked behavior and not be afraid of my child because of it. So I disagree on that. It goes on to say, other psychologists consider it a mood or as a secondary emotion that can be elicited in the face of insult or injury. Does Is that injurious or insulting toward God? to defy him does that not grieve his heart does that not insult his name absolutely it does so god has resentment according to every aspect of the word god has resentment and if god has resentment toward the wicked so also should we or else we have no part in him we should not delight in approve of tolerate, accept, and smile upon great wickedness. If people are enemies of God, they should be our enemies too. The Bible just says to love our enemies, but it does not say to appreciate and enjoy the wickedness these enemies are performing, or to look highly upon people exalting in sin. We should not. We should have resentment toward that type of individual doing that type of thing. But we should overcome that resentment by doing good unto them and bringing correction in love. Not allowing us to try to take vengeance ourselves, but rather leaving room for God to avenge and God to take the wrath, because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So, that gave God hope. But in that moment, God was feeling because God can feel we're made in his image he was feeling a lot of resentment and it was because of the evil of man if you see evil in your mother and you don't have any resentment toward her something's wrong there it means you approve of the evil you're seeing now that resentment can cross over into a murderous hatred which means the love of God is not in you but it could be a Christ-like resentment. And what can you do that's healthy with that resentment? I hate so much the evil I see in my mother, but I love her so much, I'm going to fight for her soul. And I'm going to use this rage I have against how she's hurting herself and others to seek 
her with all of my heart to speak truth into her, to never give up on her, to pray for her continually. I'm going to use this anger in me to drive me to love her more, to lay down my life for her. That's how you can use this resentment for good. So God puts anger. He, God is a angry God at times. He, he is angry with the wicked every day. He is storing up wrath for the day of his wrath. You can harness that righteous anger for good. But the Bible speaks about carnal anger. It says, be angry and yet do not sin and don't go to sleep in your anger. So don't be boiling in this anger. Use it for good during the day to push you to good works and to fight for people's souls with a righteous anger for evil. But then turn around on the back end and express your love with that anger by doing good. Use it to energize you to serve and lay down your life, to turn the other cheek. In other words, anger is not necessarily a bad thing if it's righteous anger. And anger can cause someone to act. It can give you energy. It can push you to take action. It can be used and harnessed as an energy source, both for good or for evil this case, righteous anger being used as a righteous source of energy to do righteousness. But obviously, carnal anger can be harnessed as a carnal source of energy to do carnal wickedness. So there are two sides to it. You have to make sure that it's righteous anger and that it's an anger for the Lord's things, a zealousness for the Lord. Remember, David in great fury, heard the Philistine, an uncircumcised man, taunting the Lord's armies, and he became furious. And that prompted David and energized David to become bold and say, who is this Philistine, and slay him on God's behalf. He became triggered by what Goliath was saying and taunting, mocking God. And that pushed David to action. It was righteous anger that caused David to do something he probably would not have normally wanted to do. It was very abnormal to try to take on someone who is significantly stronger than you, more powerful than you, more trained than you, better armored than you. And yet he did something abnormal and supernatural because righteous anger filled him and compelled him to take action. And so there is a precedent biblically, and I'm sure there's many more, but that's just one. There was also righteous anger in that priest of the Israelite camp that saw an Israelite soldier taking a woman that was captured in battle into his tent to lay with her. That priest, in great fury, because this was going directly against the command of the Lord, took a spear or a sword, I believe it was a spear, he went into this tent and he stabbed that spear through both of them while they were in the act. And it killed them both. And this saved the Israelites from being punished by God. Um, it appeased God's wrath by seeing this righteous act of vengeance taken out on God's behalf. Now, granted, this was Old Testament. Now, we're not to judge. We're to allow the Lord to take the vengeance. Well, this isn't... This is a nuanced topic as well, because Paul says we're not to judge those outside the church, but we are to judge those inside the church. And how he judged them was expelling them from among us. If they were being really wicked, he would deliver them over to Satan. However, we do have in the book of Acts an example of Peter with Ananias and Sapphira actually judging them and they dropped dead. Although the church is so carnal that to whom is given little, little is required. I don't think people are going to be dropping dead in church with such a wicked, carnal, lukewarm church. But if the carnal became if, if the carnal became spiritual and the church became matured 
and the church's obedience became complete, and people started lying to the Holy Spirit, as Ananias and Sapphira did, there is a possibility that as an elder of a church, the Holy Spirit could lead you to say, because you have lied to the Holy Spirit, you will join your wife, and that, or you will join your husband, and that the wife drops dead, that people can be dropping dead again, as it was at the beginning of the church. But, I'm not sure that we're going to see a church that is that holy and set apart to where they're expected to be honest with the Lord to the degree that if they're dishonest, people start dropping dead in church and bring fear upon the entire assembly. That would be pretty cool if the church became that holy that disobedience meant instant death. That would be an awesome church to be part of. I'm not sure many people would want to go to that church if people dropped dead all the time. They'd be like, I'd rather have a lukewarm church. I know I'm going to come home that Sunday. But if we're walking in holiness and righteousness, we would want to be a part of a holy assembly like that, on that level. I would. But at that time, in that theocracy, under the Old Covenant, this was something that was acceptable in God's sight. We don't now go around killing people that are being wicked in the New Covenant time. It's not the same situation. To love your enemies with all of your heart. Harness that hate for their wicked state for good. That's how God does it. You go on. Any suggestions to cure trauma created by narcissistic mental abusers that you can pass down would be much appreciated. I don't often say this and I try not to say it because people get triggered by it, but I will say it in this case, God told me. Sometimes I feel like maybe God was speaking to me, it could have been my thoughts. God told me this practically with an audible voice. I heard him clearly speaking directly to me. God told me something about this very topic, and so I'm saying this with authority, God spoke to me about this. And I'll tell you what he taught me on this matter, because I had trauma created by a narcissistic mental abuser in my life and God taught me something beautiful about it so he said that because I've been hurt by this person a lot as a self-defense mechanism I put up walls between me and this person because I didn't want to be hurt again I wanted to protect my heart from just being constantly ripped to pieces by this person that I loved. And he said that those walls I put up to protect myself were bad. He said that they prevented that person, though it pre prevented them from being able to hurt me anymore, it also prevented them from being able to show their love for me. Anytime that they did want to show love for me, I rejected it. I didn't let the love in, nor did I let the good thing, things in. I, on, I only focused on the bad, and I hardened my heart toward them, and I put up these walls. And so when they did good or loving things toward me, I rejected that. If they did bad things toward me, I rejected that. I rejected everything. So they didn't affect me. At least that's how I was seeing it. I was protecting myself. And God told me that these walls that I was putting up, though they prevented me from feeling hurt, they also prevented me from receiving their love, and more importantly, they prevented me from being able to show my love to that person. So my love was being blocked, and their love was being blocked. So we were both losing out. Whatever good exchanges you have between people you love and yourself are what's a treasure when you look back when they die or when you look back over the years you see the good times the times you laughed the times you hugged the times you shared a moment of truth and that's what you cherish and I was taking away those things that I could cherish I was taking away any good memory because I had these huge walls up and God told me to tear them down he said this he said when you tear those walls down, you will be able to express your love for them. 
and they will be able to express their love from you and you will be able to receive it because your wall is torn down. You're going to let them have some type of fingers into your heart to some degree. You're going to love them and they're going to be able to affect you. When they do good to you and they're loving to you, you're going to feel it and you're going to appreciate it and you're going to relish in it. But when they do bad to you because your walls are torn down, it's going to hurt you and it, it will be able to break your heart to a degree. But he said, I will heal that that broken heart. Whatever damage they do, I will heal it right away. Just pray for me to heal and I'll heal it. And I'll give you the ability to, quote unquote, level one forgiveness them, to restore your love for them and your willingness to die for them. That's that level one forgiveness to where you want good for them and you want to do good for them. That's level one. Not necessarily reconcile wholly like we're both in Christ and we're of one mind and we just have un unbelievable love that is um, filled with the oneness that's in Christ because we're both abiding in him. There's some type of separation between light and darkness. They can't have fully fellowship. How can two walk together hand in hand unless they be agreed? So there is a separation created by the sinner from God that's created by sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates the sinner from the saint as in the same way. If we're in Christ and in God and we are his body, then we are separated from the sinner by their sin as well. So there is some degree of separation there. And that does, the sin itself builds walls between God and man. The Bible says that. Your sin has built up barriers between me and you. So the amount of love that can be exchanged is not never-ending unconditional or it is unconditional in a sense but it's not it's being hindered by the sin if somebody that's living in sinful rebellion against god doesn't feel his love washing through them like an ocean to the point where they feel like they're going to float off their chair like somebody that's being baptized by the holy spirit there is some separation there you don't feel the full extent of his love for you you don't you don't realize it um, in the same way, they will not be able to receive the full extent of my love for them or God's love for them through me. They won't be able to receive the full revelation of that love that's able to be shared by people abiding in Christ when they're being wicked and they're in sin and their heart's hardened. A hardened heart can't fully receive the full revelation of the love of God. It can only get little dim glimpse, glimpses of that. So... That's that level two forgiveness that we can't fully do when somebody's still in rebellion. Um, so the Lord was saying also to me to see that person when I think of them to to see the good in them. Because there can still be some good that God put into them in some areas. You look for the good and you thank God for the good. Everybody's on a spectrum with some degree of truth, they believe, and some degree of darkness. And so you can find some of the good that God put in people, some of the truth they're believing, and appreciate them in, to some degree. And try to define them by the good, rather than merely and explicitly and only define them just by the evil that's in them still. And that can help you to have a better and more positive view toward them so that you're not utterly and absolutely in all facets utterly disgusted with them to the fullest extent because that could then get you into actually a murderous level hatred which if you have that degree and that level and that carnal type of hatred then the love of god's not in you it should be a perfect and loving hatred the kind that god has it should be the same as his and just as God allows the sun to shine, to rise upon the wicked and the just, so also you should shine your light upon the wicked and the just. You are the light of the world if you're in Christ. Let your light shine before men. So you have to be showing the fruits of the Spirit, even to people who are currently God's rebels, who are currently prodigals. Let your light shine before them. You go on. I will pray for you with an earnest heart. As a baby Christian who grew up in a new age house, I'm just not anywhere near the amount of time you've been with God, and I am most certainly not perfect. 
I've seen your earnest heart, and I love it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> that is mature of you even to say you're a baby Christian. That takes humility, so the Lord smiles upon that to even call yourself that. That's beautiful to to acknowledge where growth is needed. That's good. And I, I pray that you'll grow tremendously. But know that when I pray that, I'm also praying for God to put you through fiery trials and suffering. But I do that because I know I pray for myself for fiery trials and suffering. I know that that's where perseverance, character, and hope comes. And that's where you become built up to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. And that is unto a perfect man. And Paul taught with all wisdom, admonishing that he might present everyone perfect in Christ. And I want us all to be perfect in Christ. Christ is coming back for a perfect bride without spot or blemish. And I want to build up the church and the church to build up me so that we can become perfect in Christ without spot or blemish. You continue. I'm just not... Okay. Um, and I am most certainly not perfect. Well, like I said... When you're in the Spirit, and I do for sure see that you are in the Spirit at times, according to my discernment, and I could be wrong, um, you are perfect in the sight of God and you're perfect in my sight. Um, but in the sense of, do we all have places we can grow? Can we all become more knowledgeable and even more manifesting the fruits of the Spirit and learn to stay in the Spirit more consistently. Um, these are things generally everyone everyone can work on, although some of us may be staying in the Spirit consistently. That you can't work on if you're already doing that. But as far as the fruits of the Spirit being displayed more powerfully and more poignantly and more obviously and um, the love of God growing in you and your capacity to contain God's love getting bigger, your heart growing. There are so many ways we can continue to grow in the perfection that is found in Christ. Growing into him into greater measures. That part we can all do. So in that sense we're not perfect. Also we're not perfect in non-moral related senses like we get a perfect score on our math test. That's not relevant here. We're talking about the perfection of abiding in Christ and maturing in Christ here. So yeah, we can all grow more perfect, but when we're in Christ, holy hearted, wholly devoted to him in our hearts, with a pure heart in that moment while we're abiding in him, not in the flesh, in that moment we are perfect. Um, you say, your teachings would have scared me a year ago, but even when I was scared and I adhered to that same belief, your teachings would have scared me a year ago, but even when I was scared and I adhered to that same belief, I was still never healed from that trauma. So you don't believe it anymore. Neither does Dora Love, neither do so many people. You can get spoiled by false doctrines that support remaining in the flesh and come against perfection in Christ, which the Bible teaches. Um... So I, I urge you to return to believing that we can be perfect in Christ, as the Bible describes. Not some type of Mickey Mouse, I never make a mistake on a math test, and I always drive exactly the speed limit to 0.0001% accuracy. I'm not talking about a foolish, nonsensical perfect. I'm talking about moral perfection of the heart, of a heart that is loving God with all of itself, of a man who's loving the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, and all their strength. Somebody that's actually doing the first commandment. That's perfection in the sight of God. Wearing your wedding clothes, walking according to the Spirit, no longer fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And I say that we can all do that at times. Every Christian is going to be in the Spirit at times. But we want to try to stay in the Spirit all the time. But you're saying that even, even so... You were still never healed from that trauma. And like I said, um, the Lord is never healed from the trauma of seeing us sin against him until he sees us humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, seek his face, and pray. And then the trauma 
that he suffered at our rebellion, looking upon that with great anguish of heart, is healed in him. And in that place, he forgives our sins and heals our land and hears from heaven. He does not hear the prayers of sinners. So it could be that the trauma you suffered will not be fully healed until your mother fully humbles herself, turns from her wicked ways, seeks the Lord's face and prays, and also seeks your forgiveness and asks, Son, forgive me, I've done so much wrong, and I, I humbly come before you, sorry. Deeply sorry, I'm so, so sorry. Alright, so we know that if you confess and forsake your sins, you will find mercy. It doesn't say you'll find mercy even while you're still sinning against God. You must confess and forsake your sins. So there is something that is required of you first. God holds us to the same standard, I believe, that he holds himself to. Otherwise, he'd be a hypocrite, of course, according to his own definition. He practices what he preaches. So, when it talks about someone sinning against you in forgiveness, Luke 17, 4 says, Watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he repents, forgive him. That sounds like a condition. If he repents. If he's still doing it, that means he didn't repent. Does that qualify for if he repents, then forgive him? Now, there are times he says when you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. So it's like, uh, that that's so scary that it's like, do I really need to wait for someone to repent? I better just forgive them so I'll be forgiven. We can say that, but is the depth and the level of forgiveness we extend to them while they're still doing it a profound and total forgiveness? In a sense, I'd say no, it's a level one forgiveness. That's why I believe there's levels to it. We want to forgive them to a point to cover all our bases out of fear of God, just in case. But it's saying, if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times returns to say, I repent, you must forgive him. Well, wait a minute. What if he doesn't return and say, I repent? What if he just continues to sin against you over and over and over and over and over, never repents, does, the repentance doesn't even cross their mind, and they're literally harming you with no remorse whatsoever? Does this verse address that possibility? No. So what then? Once again, I say, in such a case... Just to be safe out of fear of God, forgive him to the to a point, the best you can, but a full reconciliation doesn't come without repentance on the part of the transgressor. The same way it is between us and God, it is between us and our brother that's sinning against us. There must be some type of repentance involved. So we still need to forgive to a degree, regardless, in terms of we don't want to be holding bitterness that takes root in us and gives a foothold to Satan, we need to extend at least level one forgiveness. But the full restoration requires a genuine apology and a stopping of doing that thing that's hurting. I believe this is just common sense. So I'm not giving license to not forgive, but I'm saying there is more to it as some of these verses allude to, there is that aspect of that person actually changing, repenting. And then you will hear from seated with the Lord in heavenly places, and you will forgive her fully to level two forgiveness. And the Lord will heal her heart, and you will give her your blessing, even though you can bless those who curse you, but you will be able to give her your heart and your love to a whole new level that is not possible when she's still actively and openly harming you and hurting you. Just as God gives his love to sinners that are coming home repentant and humble, 
he's able to pour out his love on them completely, no reserve there at all, like a waterfall, like an ocean. And that's not happening when they're still in rebellion. That's why it says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. There's something held back from him able to express the full degree of his love when somebody's still his enemy. And so it is with any follower of him. We're made in his image. There is something still hurt when that person is still doing the same thing that hurt us. That is understandable. The healing comes when that person repents genuinely. And that's when the Lord genuinely brings healing and is healed in his hurt for the harms we do to him. This stuff, you really have to look at it from his perspective. It's like, He's not holding us to some standard he's not on. If he's angry and he's holding back a certain degree of his love, when people are actively sinning against him, he doesn't expect us to be any different. We're his followers. We follow his example. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If Christ is holding back a certain degree of his love and is hurt and angry to a degree at sinner's so are we, if we're following his example. Let's say you completely forgave, completely accept and embrace their wickedness and evil, and you say, I approve of this. And I don't. it doesn't bother me a bit. In fact, I'm going to join them in it. Then you are actually entering into darkness with them. There has to be some degree of separation. Holiness means separated. There is some degree of separation. This is why Jesus, in what came across like an insult, when his mother and his brother came to visit him, he said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? My mother, my brother, my family, is whoever does the will of the Father. Jesus was showing that, to some degree, his true family, spiritually speaking, are people that are all in for God. If your mom's currently not all in for God, in a sense, she's not part of your spiritual family. She's part of another spiritual family. She's part of Satan's spiritual family, in a sense. Yes, she is your blood, and yes, you long for her. If you don't have murderous hatred, you long for her to be restored to the Lord and restored in your relationship with her. But her sin is building up barriers between herself and the Lord and between herself and you if you're abiding in Christ. His enemies are also your enemies, to a degree. But we're to love our enemies. So, the full reconciliation you want and the full healing you want is in part incumbent upon her changing and surrendering to the Lord. And so you're not going to have the fullness of what you want until the Lord breaks her. And you can be instrumental in that breaking process by loving her and doing good unto her, which will pour heaping coals on her head, and also speaking truth into her, which can be like daggers and bring conviction and help in that breaking process. Because the old man needs to be broken so that the new man can be released and replace the old man. That hard heart needs to be destroyed so that she can receive that new soft heart. 